<laughs> so my name is Channing Dale Johnson. Uh, birthplace, I was born in Los Angeles, um, raised in Pasadena, and I am 71 years old. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about your family background. In other words, um, where were they before Los Angeles, or were they here already? If we go back to your grandparents' generation, or if you want to go further back, it's up to you. Okay. Um, well, it, it depends on which side of the family, okay, right? Sure, um, sure. So my father's side of the family was from Mississippi, and um, I know more about my mother's side of the family mm -hmm. than I do my father's side of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know my father's side of the family was from Mississippi and came to Los Angeles. Um, the my grandparents' generation, actually on both sides, were. Uh, those who came to, well, on my father's side, yes, it was my grandparents who came to California. Uh, my mother's family uh, was from um, Louisiana via Iowa. And um, uh, my, I was born here, um, my mother was born here, and my grandmother came here uh, at a very young age. So um, I think she was in her tweens mm -hmm. uh, when she came here. So we've been here for a little bit. Very interesting. Yeah. And um, so you grew up basically in, was it in Pasadena? I grew up in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. you, uh -huh. So you did uh, public schools? So what, what was? Oh, I'm a public school child. Okay. Yes, yeah. absolutely. In, in fact, um, I wasn't really that familiar with private school children mm -hmm. until I went to college. Okay. Um, I went to um, uh, <laughs> I went to um, public school as a, at a very young age. Um, How young? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I got. <laughs> I got kicked out. <laughs> my, my parents. Uh, it's not true that I did not go to pri private school. I, uh, mm -hmm. in, I think in the first grade, I was taken out of public school, um, and put into a Lutheran private mm -hmm. school. Uh, and um, I. I got removed <laughs> from Lutheran school and then went to, to public school um, for the remainder of my elementary school years, mm -hmm. my middle school years, and all the way through high school. And um, gosh, this is horrible. I actually got kicked out of high school too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Would you like to talk about that? Um, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> The first, uh, I met my parents took me out of out of uh, first grade. Uh, I think. Well, I know why because mm -hmm. the entrepreneur in me. This was a time in which you could collect bottles, mm -hmm. and you could mm -hmm. turn the bottles mm -hmm. into the store and get sure. money for sure. them, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. on my way, walking to school, I had a habit of of um, finding bottles everywhere I could. I just constantly, when I realized that you could, you, these bottles you could turn in for money, all of a sudden it just yeah. clicked. Like yeah. it was, I was obsessed yeah. with it. So then I would go collect these bottles, turn them in, get money, and buy candy with it. Mm -hmm. Come back to the school and either give away candy for favors or sell the candy. <laughs> and I was constantly late. And I engaged a friend of mine in it, and we were now both constantly mm. late. And my parents felt like I was going to turn into <laughs> whatever they thought, you know, a, a, uh, a, mm. a an unruly child, right. whatever. And yeah. they took me out um, and put me in a uh, a Lutheran school, mm. German Lutheran mm. school. Um, what was that like? Horrible. Yeah. It was absolutely horrible. Um, it was at a time in which they were very comfortable hitting you, mm. and I did not like to be, mm. I did not like to be mm. 
touched inappropriately in any way. And they used, they, corporal mm -hmm. punishment was um, mm -hmm. uh, something that they utilized as a part of the process. Uh, and uh, in sixth grade, I just completely rebelled. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to fight back. And you, you, know, you, you don't fight back physically and remain in school. Mm -hmm. But that was my objective. I had told my parents about it, but mm -hmm. they, didn't do anything about it, so mm -hmm. I took it on my own. Mm -hmm. So I fought back yep. and got kicked out happily and then went to sixth grade. Were you the only black student? I was not, no. It was a Which school that um, it was fairly integrated, hmm. um, fairly integrated. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yes. Um, but no, it was not one of those. Mm -hmm. It was not a, you know, it was not a hoity-toity mm -hmm. private school. Mm -hmm. um, it had other black students in it. Um, hmm. But they, you know, they were very strict, mm -hmm. and um, I just didn't feel like uh, it was appropriate mm -hmm. for them to uh, be putting their hands on mm -hmm. on me. Mm -hmm. So, so um, when I got kicked out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, it was for political activity. So mm -hmm. I'm the I'm the product of I'm I'm the product of my mother's mind and my father's mm -hmm. mind, right? And my mother was. Um, um, a professor, uh, and she's the two of them have always been very political, particularly my mother, and so she raised a political child. Where was she a professor? So it was interesting. My my mother, when I was in elementary school, she taught elementary school. When I was in middle school, she taught middle school. When I was in high school, she taught high school, and then started teaching college at Pasadena City College. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then she became a professor at USC and uh, then became the first black woman to receive her PhD in public policy from USC. So I had, had the you know, wonderful benefit of having a mother who was a teacher and who was familiar with what I was learning. So she was my disciplinarian, but she always did it a completely different way, which was she, if there was something I was doing that um, she thought was wrong. She, um, she expressed her um, disappointment in me, and that was the worst thing mm -hmm. you could ever do <laughs> to me, is for me to disappoint my mother. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I got kicked out of the Pasadena School District uh, for political activities, and this was in 1960. 1968-69, it was um, during the, the dead in the middle of the Black Power Movement. Um, I was very political. I, I played sports, ran track, played football, um, was very active on campus, and I used, um, I used that to organize uh, the three high schools in Pasadena, and we, um, we shut them down and caused the school district a lot of money. You need to explain this in some detail. What, how did you shut them down? Um, by literally, by, li well, there was no internet at the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, literally um, would go campus to campus and, and uh, cause rallies. Mm. Uh, and I had friends at all three high schools. Um, when you, Pasadena is a small community. Mm -hmm. And I had friends all over the city, and I had friends at all three high schools. My mother taught at that time at one of the high schools, mm -hmm. and um, I just we, we just went about organizing them, mm -hmm. and we had uh, uh, campus walkouts, and we didn't go back to school. My mother, who was a teacher and knew a lot of the teachers, uh, organized um, what they effectively teach ins at. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the churches in Pasadena, mm -hmm. and so we would gather and... Do you remember the church's name? I do not remember okay. the church's okay. name. Um, I should, but I really don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they brought in speakers and so mm -hmm. forth, and then we had our own sessions. Um, and it was basically, the, these were sit-ins and demonstrations Regarding, regarding, uh, it it started out. It started out 
uh, with something very, very simple for high school students, which was the uh, selection of cheerleaders and song girls mm -hmm. at my high school, John Muir High School, which um, had a very substantial black population. If you looked at the three high schools, it mm -hmm. had the largest mm -hmm. black population. Um, but, you know, somehow um, uh, the, the representation mm -hmm. wasn't there, it wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. We also had uh, a couple of coaches who were a real issue, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of the way they addressed us as black players. Mm -hmm. um, and Can you say more about that? Um, you know, they, uh, they, they were pejorative mm -hmm. in, in, in their way of addressing us. Mm -hmm. um, they clearly showed bias toward, you know, um, certain white players. And then we got a black coach and it made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really the selection of cheerleaders and song girls um, mm -hmm. and flag girls mm -hmm. um, that kind of started kicking off a discussion about uh, instances of bias that we observed in the school. That kicked off a similar discussion mm -hmm. at other schools mm -hmm. and students were, and it became a, 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 a me too, a, you know, mm -hmm. we've noticed the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it is, it became a real discussion about, you know, bias that we saw. Um, and ultimately, we, um, uh, during one of my organizing activities, um, I learned not to go on campus, I learned to stay off campus, um, and two of my co-organizers uh, I was sitting off campus with two of my co-organizers. Two of my co-organizers came to meet us and the uh, LA County Sheriff's Department had been mm -hmm. following us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they arrested us and charged us with um, uh, a number of, um, of crimes, in, including inciting a riot, um, uh, I've forgotten uh, it was a long litany of mm. of, of of crimes. Um, uh, How old were you? Seventeen years old. They arrested you. Not only did they arrest me, they arrested me and um, and two of my friends, and they beat us unconscious. Mm. And um, um, you know, there are photos of it that mm -hmm. my parents took and uh, they put us on trial, um, hired a local lawyer uh, who, um, who ultimately became a judge um, and um, he was able to get the charges dropped uh, right before we went to trial. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was becoming a big thing. Um, the school district was not happy with me. Yeah. Um, the good news is that I'd always been an excellent student and had been admitted to Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother didn't quite know what to do with me in the meantime, um, so mm -hmm. uh, she, um, I, had, I had been accepted at UCLA. I had chosen Stanford, which was a bit of a disappointment mm -hmm. to the family because I would have been third generation UCLA. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother called a woman named Mary Jane Hewitt um, who was um, a part of the administration at UCLA, a wonderful black woman um, who mm -hmm. was like a mother to the black students at UCLA. And she basically said, Mary Jane, I know Channing turned you down, but here's the situation. She said, yes, I've been reading about it, and can you let him in to UCLA for the spring quarter of 1969? And she said, fine, of course. And I, I attended UCLA, but what my mother did not know is that it was in fact members of the UCLA Student Union, Black Student Union, who had been actually helping me organize in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the phrase from the frying pan into the fire, <laughs> it was literally the frying pan into the fire. So when I showed up at the Black Student Union meeting, they're like, Channing, what are you doing here? I'm like, yeah, you wouldn't, know. <laughs> you wouldn't imagine what happened, right? Yep. Um, and it happened to be the same quarter that um, 
there was a dispute at the Black Student Union um, uh, meeting uh, where um, our apprentice Bunchy Carter got shot by um, uh, alle then allegedly members of, um, of a nationalist organization um, run by Maulana Ron Karanga. Um, this was the president? Who, who got shot? A, uh, he was not the president no. of the Black Student Union, but he was uh, a a um, he was an important mm. um, he was an important uh, figure in the uh, in this uh, Black Student Union movement, and he happened to be at a at a uh, UCLA Black Student Union mm -hmm. meeting. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, the white students um, were. Uh, engaged in protesting against the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and um, the whole campus went out on strike. So I just went from one strike to another <laughs> strike. The uh, whole campus went out on strike that spring quarter. Um, so it, yet again, frying pan into the fire. Um, um, and I had left home by that time. Uh, my father and I were just not getting along mm -hmm. and so my the middle of my senior year of high school, um, I just left home. And I really never went back home mm -hmm. after that. I just, I lived among uh, friends and family uh, until I went off to college. Um, and um, my parents took me to college in October of um, 1969 at Stanford. Um, and um, mm -hmm. when I got to Stanford, um, the president of the Black Student Union, Union knew of me and um, I, uh, I got very involved in politics at, <laughs> at Stanford. Mm -hmm. um, and what, so your mother, uh, when, when she moved to this area, am I? Uh, my mother was she, born here. She was born here. Yes. Okay, so she was yeah, born here. Yeah, my grandmother moved here very young. Ah, my, okay. my mother, <clears throat> my mother and her sister were raised first in Watts mm. and then moved to Pasadena, were raised in Pasadena, mm. and they both went to UCLA together. Mm. And, and uh, obviously she was an educator from the very beginning, right? She was a social worker at first. Ah, okay. And... Um, Where did she go to school? Um, so, uh, so my mother got her so she went to UCLA. Mm -hmm. My mother and her older sister went to UCLA. Mm -hmm. My mother, my grandmother was very smart. Um, my, my mother graduated very young from high school. Mm -hmm. Her older sister, so as a result, my mother and her older sister, Betty Saar, now Saar, they were both brown at the time, mm -hmm. um, could go to UCLA together. Mm -hmm. My grandmother and my grandfather had gone to UCLA, and that's where they had met. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was important to my grandmother that her daughters go to UCLA. Mm -hmm. And um, they grew up in Pasadena and took the red car from mm -hmm. Pasadena mm -hmm. out to UCLA to this campus right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was brand new. It was just surrounded at that time. It was not poppy fields. Is this the, mm -hmm. a building here, a building there, and, and poppy fields? Um, UCLA didn't have uh, discrimination laws. You know, um, public school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. There, were, mm -hmm. I, I guess there was. There was de facto in the sense mm -hmm. that there weren't that many black students sure. there. Um, when I meet, uh, when I meet folks who are of that in my community, who are of my mother's mm -hmm. generation, which mm -hmm. there aren't that many left, mm -hmm. um, and they talk about UCLA, mm -hmm. they you know they refer back to the days when Ralph Bunch was there, mm -hmm. and Ralph Bunch was there. My grandparents were there when Ralph Bunch was mm -hmm. there, and you know they refer back to the, you know the the 40s, and my, you know my mother and and my aunt Betty were there then. Um, there were you know there were black students mm -hmm. there. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And your father, what, what was the friction, if I may ask, or would you not? 
Okay. You know, um, it's one of those, I think it's just one of those very natural things. Um, it, it, fathers and sons have to have breaks. There just has to be that point where, you know, I was, my, my father was very controlling about things, you know, and he had his, he had his thoughts about the way I ought to be thinking or conducting myself. And I was, um, I mean, it was, it was the late 60s. I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was mm -hmm. trying, I, I wanted to have a freer mind yeah. and a freer body. And I think my attitude, and it was probably very much selfishness on my part, but mm -hmm. what am I, I'm 17, right? Um, my attitude was I've done everything you wanted me to do. I have a great academic record. I've gotten into one of the best colleges on the planet. Um, I'm an athlete. Mm. I'm, I don't have a criminal record, <laughs> although I was about to have a criminal <laughs> record. <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a good kid, yeah. right? Um, like, and I, I think a lot of it was just you know, there was still. Mm. You know, I want to know where you are. I want to know when you're coming back. I want to know who your friends are. And so, when my attitude was, no, I, I, I need to grow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, he still, I think he still needed me kind of chained to mm -hmm. the regimen that I had grown up with, which was very much involved in everything related to the life of a home. You know, I. I learned to I learned to cook at a very early age. I learned to clean at a very early er, very early age. We never had a mop. We every floor was done like mm. was done, you know, just yeah. bucket, pail, hands, mm. knees. You know, that's how you did the kitchen. Um, you know. Um, and you had siblings? No, I'm an only child. You're an only child. Right. Okay. Yeah, and it was and I and it was a uh, it was a very middle. Very middle class child. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in nice homes. My father was a mechanical engineer. He became an architect. That he became a general contractor. Mm -hmm. I grew up working on his crews, mm -hmm. um, and he's just very hands on. But everything around the house was just it was very disciplined, mm -hmm. you know. And I grew up in a home that he ultimately built, which was mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Where did he get his degree? From uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Mm. Yeah. Nice school. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I always say, my, my father, I think probably it, it, as, I, as I look back on it, um, you know, I always, I, I say about my, I always tease my father, and he's passed now, but I used to tease him. I said, you know, you married up. And mm. he would, he, he <laughs> said, you, he would say, damn straight I did, right? And, you know, my mother is, you know, came from a, you know, an intellectual and artistic family. Um, all of them very smart. Um, my father's family also very smart. But my father grew up in a different kind of family, a bunch of boys. Mm -hmm. And they were, um, they were f all fun loving. And, and, I, and I think my father tried to not show me but you can't hide things from, particularly yeah. if it's a boy, yeah. about a father. Mm -hmm. You yeah. can't hide, because I, I know all of his, his mm -hmm. brothers, my uncles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I knew that he was like the fun-loving guy. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and when they would mm -hmm. have friends over, I mean, I could hear him, he's the fun-loving guy. And I think there was an element of him that wanted to reign, he could see that in me, mm -hmm and he wanted to rein it in. He didn't want that to take over mm -hmm. the part that he thought was going to lead to success, right? Without understanding that there's a balance of yeah. it too. Yeah. Or I guess he knew there was a balance, he just wanted to at yeah. a certain point. Um, so he, um, so I always tease him and I said, so like, you know, there's part of me that's this kind of uh, uh, fun-loving, you know, guy who who wants to explore everything, and I was a wanderer. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's part of me that's this kind of intellectual. Um, it's um, curious about everything, um, and the academics were always came fairly easily. Mm -hmm.
although yes. I don't particularly like academics. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's no, your it's, it's your right. field, but it's all right. But <laughs> I, academic <laughs> application to real world problems kind of drives me crazy, yes. and that's the dispute I, that Ernie and I have. And I agree with you yeah, on that. It just drives yes, me crazy. Yes. yes. They're good at diagnosis, but that's about it. That's about it. It I just, dry, it just yeah. drives me nuts. I it's know. like, okay, I keep going, and? <laughs> that's all. That's right. great. It's observation, but okay, now let's talk about how we, because yeah. I'm a lawyer, and that's right. what exactly. we do. You know, it's exactly. like, okay, now, yeah. we, now well, let's, let's resolve the issue. Yes, right? yes. So, may I, your father, he was an architect. Uh, did he was a mechanical he, engineer and engineer, then became, became an architect. An architect. Yes. And did he have his own firm? He did. Yeah, and, um, and are his buildings in LA? Or do, or, uh, so he did homes. He was mm -hmm. an architect and an engineer, an, a, and a general contractor. Mm -hmm. So he was more successful as a general contractor mm -hmm. than as an architect. At that time, there were very few black architects. Mm -hmm. It was just tough to, to make a living. I mean, you, you have wonderful examples of Paul Williams mm -hmm. uh, and Bob Kennard. Um, uh, Bob Kennard was a mentor of mine, but mm. um, but back then there were very few black architects. I mean, even then, you know, Paul Williams was so. This is you know the this was the the '60s. Um, you know, Paul Williams was still on the ascension. You know. Um, but it was but just not easy. Is it was not. Thought. It was not easy for him. But it didn't matter for him because. Mm -hmm. He did architecture on the side. It was really about his his construction work. Mm -hmm. But the, to answer your question is mm -hmm. yes, the home that I grew up in mm -hmm. in high school. Mm -hmm. um, so it you know it's wonderful. I mean, how many how many young people get to grow mm -hmm. up in a home that mm -hmm. their father designed? You know, mm -hmm. um, a home in Pasadena, another home in Pasadena that has been owned forever by a, a family that I'm very close to, um, which is um, Bob and Joan Williams' home. It's now the Williams Wood home, and there are multiple generations that have grown up in that home. There's another home um, there on the Arroyo looking at the Rose Bowl that my father designed. We knew the family forever. Um, and he designed that home. Um, so, and I grew up in that home um, because the family was like a second family for me. Uh, there are two homes in Altadena that, um, that Judge Sheets and his wife um, lived in um, that um, I, I know very well. I, I, he designed them and built them. Are these all black families? These are all black families. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So that's ex yeah. So he never, on the architectural side, mm -hmm. He, all of his clients were, were middle class and upper middle class black families. I hadn't thought about that, but yes. And that was, I'm assuming, I'm not trying to put any, but the, the difficulty of, of uh, going beyond the black community I, was there for an architect? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's the reason that <coughs> Paul Williams drew upside down, um, because he could not mm -hmm. be proximate to you know, particularly the woman of, of his of his white clients, right? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, there was a, there was an issue. Um, That's interesting. I didn't know this about Mr. Williams. So he had to draw upside down. So that could you explain that? So in the process <coughs> of designing a home, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it's no surprise that the uh, the woman has the most influence sure. in, yeah. in it's the home, right? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and um, but for Paul Williams, who did design overwhelmingly for very rich white families, mm -hmm. um, as, I mean, he was pure genius, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They recognized it. They wanted him there. But he also knew that um, there was going to be a, a, an issue, a level of what they would consider to be inappropriateness mm -hmm. if he were to come around to the side of them, get proximate, and, and draw yeah. ideas. So he learned to be on the opposite side of the table, reach across, and to literally draw upside down for them. Um, he also knew, very smart man, he also knew that um, it was going to be uh, unique mm. and that it was, a, it was a bit of a calling card. Yeah. 
know. Very interesting. But for somebody like my father, who was, you know, he was an architect of convenience. I mean, it was something he loved. Sure. And it was also something that, um, you know, I really had not thought about, um, you know, the, the extent to which I was just involved in every aspect of their life. I mean, mm -hmm. I, on his, for his construction crews, I was taught to do his payroll, so I did all of his payroll. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I, his architecture board, um, his drawing board that he had in his office, um, when, you, when you make a mistake or mm -hmm. something is off, it's a lot of erasing, and the one thing they don't like doing is erasing. Mm -hmm. They like drawing, mm -hmm. they but don't like erasing, right? So my father had this big electric eraser, and when they were, <laughs> I would be the one called in to do the boring job of erasing <laughs> each of the, the lines. But he taught me to print, mm -hmm. and he was very meticulous about his printing, and he taught me to print, and then it got me to a certain, a certain point. Uh, where I could very accurately mimic his printing. It's probably why he didn't want me to leave now that I think about it. <laughs> there you go. He's <laughs> like, he would have to go back to doing all of this himself. Of course. Yeah. So, can you just speak about uh, the black community in, in Pasadena when you were growing up? What's that like? <coughs> Um, you know, it was a very tight-knit community. Um, you know, Pasadena was one of those, so Pasadena was a, um, a community in general where uh, the owners uh, of businesses, manufacturing businesses that were downtown LA, their homes were in Pasadena, which is why the Pasadena Freeway mm -hmm. was, um, the first freeway built in Southern mm -hmm. California. And it basically was to get people, wealthy people, from their homes in Pasadena mm -hmm. to their businesses in downtown Los Angeles, right? The manufacturing businesses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The same for the lawyers, same for the finance executives, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. So you had this burgeoning um, uh, white wealth in Pasadena. Uh, they needed help. So you had a number of people, a uh, number of black folks coming to Pasadena to service these families. And, um, you know, service was something that um, paid fairly well relative to all, a lot of the other options that were mm -hmm. available. And uh, with the growth of the black community there, other other people came to service that community. So the way my family ended, in, ended up in Pasadena was that my grandfather uh, was at um, Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company. Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company was um, the life insurance company like North Carolina Mutual on the East Coast. Golden State serviced the black community with respect to life insurance policies overwhelmingly um, um, uh, you know, death or, and, and burial policies. And my, uh, my grandfather was asked to open the Pasadena branch of Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company. Um, and he moved to Pasadena and because it was a growing black community. From yeah. where? From Los Angeles, from oh, Watts. Okay. I yes. see. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so <clears throat> the black community moved in for these services that were needed at the time as Pasadena was emerging as this. Yes. Wealthy. That's what drove it. That's what Yeah, drove I mean, it. Not, that's not to say that there weren't people who just chose to live in Pasadena sure, because. Sure. But that was, the, but that, the, was, that was the core economic driver. And it was, you said, a very close knit community. It became a very close knit yeah. community. How large would you say? I have, I, mean, I have no oh, idea. Okay. So. Um, but I can tell you, my, my physician was um, initially the only black physician in town. Um, there were, um, and so, I mean, even when I was in high school, 
there were probably only four black physicians in town. Um, now there are so many more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as lawyers, I knew, I knew two lawyers. Um, um, and, two and black lawyers in, yeah. uh, in Pasadena. And it was, um, was there, I mean, you mentioned the brutality of the police when they arrested you, but beyond that, what was it like for the black community? Were there fears? Were there uh, always fear of the police? Always fear of the police. Yes, okay. no, not fear of violence among the white population. Mm -hmm. Um, not the craziness that you see out there today mm -hmm. where people feel comfortable taking people of color's life mm -hmm. uh, or, or engaging in intimidation or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the police? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I think, frankly, that was a function of um, the, they viewed, particularly in Altadena, mm -hmm. um, I lived in Pasadena and Altadena, mm -hmm. two very different mm -hmm. Um, the Altadena was unincorporated county, so that was the sheriff's. Pasadena was mm -hmm. Pasadena Police Department. Mm -hmm. Both had the same function. Both had the function mm -hmm. of keeping people of color in line. So that was the instrumentality. So I don't think, as a general proposition, people felt like the need to engage in, um, you know, uh, the, the self law people, enforcement. The, the citizens, you mm -hmm. mean, yeah. Yeah. Because the police department was there for that reason. Correct. Yeah. Mm. And, they, and particularly in Altadena, um, they indiscriminately engaged in what I consider to be terror, you know, which is indiscriminate stops. Mm. Um, you, know, you know, boy, what are you doing here? You know, um, whose car is this? Yeah, yeah you know, just the, mm -hmm. just, it's, it's terror. You know, it's what it is. It's, it's, it, is, it is saying in a very direct way, we are in charge. Mm -hmm. I control your life. I control whether you go home or not. And, um, um, and I get to abuse you upon occasion to make sure that you know who's the top dog. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was life then. And frankly, it's been, in my opinion, the nature of being black in America for 400 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's the primary purpose of police, in my opinion. I mean, look, they're, they're the day-to-day -day crimes, but there is a fundamental element of their purpose being mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to control elements of society that um, people who are in power want controlled. So, um, would you say the fear of the police was, I mean, I know you can't compare it to other communities, but whether, I mean, that, this basically is the case all over the U.S. <clears throat> at that time. Am I right? <clears throat> that the police have this function? Yes. Or, or is that an accurate statement on my part? Yes. Okay. But not, a, not at that time. It, it's been true for 400 years, of course, and it's of as course. just as true today as it was then. As it was then, yes. yes. So th this, was, this has been a common thing in the history of the U.S. And that, so for the African American, for the black community, law has a different meaning. Law does not support them. It, it has a schizophrenic okay. kind of meaning because it is, what progress we have made, we've made through law, and yet law enforcement, mm -hmm. we recognize is there to control us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so the community was, I mean, you said there was a black physician, there were mm -hmm. obviously teachers, teachers but, you know, but also schools were not segregated. <laughs> so schools were initially segregated. Mm -hmm. um, so you had the school I went to, John Muir High School, which was overwhelmingly black. And then you had Pasadena mm -hmm. High School, which was overwhelmingly mm -hmm. white. And there were the only two high schools. Ultimately, a third high school was built. Blair High School, which is where my mother taught. Uh, it was new at the time. 
and they made a, a real effort for it to be um, integrated, mm -hmm. particularly integrated. And then there were efforts to integrate Pasadena High School more so. And so when I was in high school, you had Blair, a very integrated high school. You had John, you had Pasadena High School, which had traditionally been Lily White, which had, um, uh, was substantially more integrated than it had been before, but the most white among the three. And then you had my high school, which was integrated, but uh, had the largest black population. Of, of students, mm -hmm. and so those were the three high schools. And was that in, was the if I may call it segregation because that's what it was? Did, were there restaurants? Were there issues about none? none. No, that California is a very different that's experience. What, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so you know, my fiance grew up in um, in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, mm -hmm. born, mm -hmm. raised in very early years, mm -hmm. and then. Um, and her family um, home um, in Atlanta during her uh, middle school to high school years. So she grew up in the South. Mm -hmm. um, she was accustomed to seeing, um, you know, very typical signage with respect to, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. segregation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and fairly blatant segregation. We didn't see that as much here in California. Mm -hmm. But having said that, mm -hmm. um, the uh, beaches were segregated until Dr. Hudson and the NAACP came along and uh, integrated what, what the year? beaches. Roughly, <coughs> late 60s? No, I think <laughs> uh, 50s, but I'm not 50s. sure. Okay. You'd have to, okay. to look, look that up. Yeah. Um, um, <coughs> It could have been early 60s, but mm -hmm. I think 50s. Um, so you had housing discrimination. You've always had housing yeah. discrimination. We have housing discrimination today. Um, and they do it through, through discrimination with respect to financing for the most part. Right? Um, Can you explain that, please? Sure. For someone who, OK. We're ta you're, it's, not, it's beyond me. It's for the audience that will sure, eventually. Yes. Sure. I mean, there are, there are lots of ways to discriminate with, with respect to housing. I mean, people could just choose not to sell to somebody right. of, of, right. of, of color, right? Um, but then there are also kind of, there are all kinds of you know systemic ways mm -hmm. of of in, engaging in it. You know, one of which, which we continue to see today, is on the appraisal side. Um, so. You and I have this, we both want to buy the same home. Um, and of course, you have to go get an appraisal, take it to your bank, and I have to go get the appraisal on the same home. You and I can walk into the same appraiser, mm -hmm. and um, they, will, they will give me a lower appraisal uh, and give you a higher appraisal, thereby increasing the probability that you're going to be able to buy the home because. You know, you've got a higher appraisal, you've got more room um, uh, there to, um, um, uh, same price, same sale price, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but now you've got an advantage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll appraise the house at lower than what the sale price is. Oh, no, you can't buy this house. Mm -hmm. I know they said they're going to sell it to you. I, I know you want to buy it for half a million dollars, but it only appraises at 480, so we're, no. Mm -hmm. no. You may get an appraisal for 520 or 550. So that's a fairly typical way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, there are all kinds of other contingencies, which is um, your interest rate mm -hmm. will be lower than mine. You know, why is mine higher? Same income, mm -hmm. same price of the house. You know, it's who I am, yeah. you know. And, there, and this system has built in uh, subjectivity, right? People are constantly making decisions. Mm -hmm. you know, I face it with my clients right now, where you know, I have, I have, I'll represent a black businessman, and, I'll, and I will watch the different, and, and I, I, you know, I'm a partner in a major law firm, so I represent white businesses and black businesses mm -hmm. and brown businesses and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I see the differences between the way the bankers deal with mm -hmm. my clients. Um, 
you know. I see younger, younger, um, um, less accomplished, smaller, white-owned businesses get much greater accommodations at banks than an older, more experienced, larger mm. black-owned business. And they were like, yeah, there's this issue, there's a concentration of client concentration, not enough diversity. Um, mm. You know, I don't know, I don't, just don't feel good about it, you know, whatever. You know, just there's a subjectivity. There's a subjectivity relative to the deployment of capital across the board. Um, so there's discrimination in that respect with respect to housing and with respect to general commerce. So, so the experience in California for blacks has been different, you're, you're suggesting? Absolutely, which is why you see so many black folks coming to California. Okay. Um, during the, um, you know, during the, uh, you know, 30s, 40s, 40s. 50s, mm -hmm. 60s, mm -hmm. you know. Did the railroads have anything to do with that? I don't think so. Okay. No, no, I think it's a different era. They just felt, that it was just they realized there were different opportunities here? Well, I mean, it, it, I think a lot, it, it depends. You know, if you read the warmth of, a, of, a, of other yeah, suns, you, you, you see that it did, wasn't just in California, it was up north, it was mm -hmm. to the east, mm -hmm. out of the south, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I think a lot of it had to do with, um, the, you know, the proclivity of certain families. Mm -hmm. um, and um, where they felt comfortable and where uh, other members of their family had gone. It gets its own kind of, a, of momentum. Mm -hmm. But I think what you find is um, people who are more fortune seekers mm -hmm. went west. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had others who just came west out of survival. You know, Dr. H. Claude Hudson, um, who uh, founded the NAACP here and, or, and, and um, uh, integrated the beaches and was one of the very early black um, dentists here in Los Angeles. He was run out of Louisiana. I mean, he had to, he had to leave. They were going to lynch him. Mm -hmm. So he chose to go west. Could he have gone north? Yeah, he could have, but he chose to go west. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think for a lot of good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, the, the discrimination was not as blatant here, mm -hmm. but it was just as real. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But it's a but um, in in terms of the black uh, population in California, uh, would you say that versus let's say those who went Chicago or other places in the north, <clears throat> would you say? What would be the difference between California and those other areas of the country? You know, I don't know. All I know is what others tell me about their experiences. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that there was just, I think there was greater opportunity here in California because of, you know, just growth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there was a labor force, mm -hmm. they needed a labor force, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, economic needs can outweigh a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so there was a need for a labor force. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And there wasn't a built-in, um, there was less of a built-in system of discrimination because the systems were just kind of being put in place here. Um, uh, whereas if you go to Chicago or Detroit, mm -hmm. um, there was a real need for a labor force there too, mm -hmm. uh, but there was also a bit of a, there was, th these are older cities. Mm -hmm. You know, Los Angeles is a new city. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, the old city was San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And living in, in Pasadena, so where were the other uh, large African-American populations in the LA area? Uh, well, the, the largest was still in South, South Central Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which is the community my family came from. But mm -hmm. They came from Watts. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so uh, it was an expansion to Pasadena, you know, mm -hmm. out of the South Central LA community. Um, uh, Watts, Compton, well, not even Compton then. Compton was white. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was really basically Watts. Mm -hmm. you know. All right, so now I'd like to go back to your university experience. So you said at first you came to UCLA? I was at UCLA for the spring quarter of 1969. But then you went to Stanford? Yes, I had already been admitted to Stanford. Okay. Yes. What was that like? I love Stanford. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I mean, I, I loved the environment of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a large, um, a large black population. Hmm. So I have I have been the beneficiary of a <coughs> of a um, a large group of um, uh, academically accomplished students who have gone through um, um, high level private institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, you know, I, I was a big beneficiary of that. So when I got to Stanford, um, there were a number of, um, of I, I was, I would call it the second wave. Mm -hmm. um, some people look at us and say, well, no, you're part of the, the first wave. And I guess it depends on how you, mm -hmm. but when I got there, um, the black students had already commandeered a, a house. Hmm. Small house, but a house mm -hmm. right in the middle of the campus mm -hmm. that it had uh, designated the black house, and it was the heart of our home. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the place where we gathered, and it's the place where we organized, and it's the and it's the place where we engaged in um, self survival. Mm -hmm. um, it's a place where we came and kind of licked our wounds and. Dealt Can with you it. speak more about the self-survivor leaking wounds? What, is, what does that mean to someone who doesn't and wasn't there? Um, you know, it's about. So if if I come, I came out of John Muir High School. John Muir High School was a high school where black culture, well, even though it was integrated, black culture was kind of a driving force in the high school. I mean, we played football. All the music, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. drums, everything was came from a very black perspective. Mm -hmm. If well, I was on campus, around me <coughs> were, you know, were, you know, all my friends, and it was very much a black culture. Um, <coughs> you get to Stanford, and it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you look, everybody in authority is white. Although at John Muir. Folks in authority for with for the most part mm -hmm. white. I mean, I remember my college counselor basically telling me I was not going to go. Asked me where I wanted to go go to college, and I said Stanford, and they, she was mm -hmm. like that. And I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, it could be just the most blatant form of racism, which was how my mother took it, mm -hmm. which is why she went down there and had a real conversation. Mm -hmm. But academically, there was no reason mm -hmm. for her to be saying that. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I digress a bit, but when you when you get onto a campus like Stanford and you come from the environment in which I came from, um, it, you know, it's not. You know, there's nothing familiar about it. Mm -hmm. right? I loved it because I love the um, I love the outdoors, mm -hmm. and Stanford mm -hmm. felt very open. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I loved its location. I loved the weather. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I love sports. Stanford had a great sports mm -hmm. program. And, um, and I could still continue to engage in my political activities because the, the students that were still on campus but were ahead of me mm -hmm. had engaged in, in, um, uh, in very direct political activity when I came, I mean, mm -hmm. there were some things um, that they wanted changed about the university and, and policies and, and what the university supported with, with its investments and so forth. And when I got to campus, um, they were still repairing the student union because they had, you know, engaged in a, in a takeover of, 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 the, of the student union. Um, so, you know, Stanford for me was 
both um, new and unfamiliar and not welcoming in its, in its mm -hmm. core environment, but welcoming in the sense that there was a black community there for me to mm -hmm. fit into. Does that, yeah. does that make yes. sense? Yeah. Um, and it's just like when I got to Harvard Law School, it was even less welcoming mm -hmm. uh, because then, you know, you're walking down hallways and you just see a bunch of, you mm -hmm. see photos of all the deans and the key professors and they're just all white men, period, just yeah. all the way across. Yeah. And you, in your classroom, it's just all, you know, all white men, no women, no mm -hmm. people of color, just, and, you know, mm -hmm. talk about really, un and old, you know, I mean, they, yeah. places, that was a very different experience, mm -hmm. didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. But Stanford, I felt um, a little bit different about Well, there was a support community, so to speak. There was, and at Harvard Law School, there was too, but not the same mm -hmm. way, because it was such an intense academic environment mm -hmm. that you didn't have as much time as you have mm -hmm. in college. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. So you were at Stanford what years? Um, I was at Stanford from 1969 to 1972. And studied? Economics. Uh -huh. yeah. But generally, th that experience was good. Absolutely. Yeah. Loved no, it. no police issues. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a few police issues. <laughs> okay. I mean, I was very, I was very active. Yeah. You know, yes, we had okay. a few police issues. We had some fun. You know. You were active politically. Oh yeah, very yeah, active you politically. Were, you were also yeah. doing. Yeah, I was very busy in college. You, I, I was active politically. <laughs> um, you know, we we took control along with the um, um, along with the very progressive white organizations, mm -hmm. the the Chicanos and us. We took control of the Associated Student Union. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was always very much into music and arts and culture, mm -hmm. and um, the Stanford had a budget to bring um, arts culture music, et cetera, concerts, et cetera, mm -hmm. to, that was controlled by the Associated Student Union. Um, and when we took control of the Associated Student Union, I was able to, to, I was able to put myself into that position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was never really happy with the, with the acts that they brought to, the music acts that they brought to mm -hmm. Stanford because it was just a different sensibility. Mm -hmm. And I was looking out over the landscape, and this was the late 60s, you know, early 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, so I, when I got control of that budget, I went another direction. <laughs> so, you know, so I brought, yeah. you know, so cool. I brought Sly and the Family Stone. Mm. Um, I brought Muhammad Ali. Oh, wow. I, I put mm. 25,000 people in, um, in, into... Uh, uh, into the uh, st uh, Stanford for um, for um, Sly and the Family Stone. I brought, mm -hmm. I got like 7,000 people out for Muhammad Ali, I, um, Janis Joplin, Big mm -hmm. Brother and the Holding Company, all acts that were very mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. progressive sure. acts at the time I brought to the campus. Um, and left them with a lot, of, a lot more money than I started out with when I, when I left. Um, so th th that's why I have really fond memories mm -hmm. of Stanford mm -hmm. because. Uh, but you you have uh, you've always been kind of a leader. Uh, yeah, because I yes, and uh, really for only one reason, and mm -hmm. and part of it might have to do with the conflict with my father, mm -hmm. which is it, it seems to me in life you have two choices, you know you can lead or be led, mm -hmm. and as between the two, it mm -hmm. seems obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And then you go to law school in, at Harvard. Yes. <clears throat> I, I was going to Stanford. I, was, I had been admitted to both, and I was headed to Stanford. Okay. And I met, um, my parents met um, a, <laughs> met a then young man who uh, was in his last year at Harvard Law School. And they, they told him that that they had a son who was getting ready to go to law school. And he said, where is he going? They said, Stanford. And he said, well, why didn't he apply to Harvard? And they said, well, he did, but he's going to Stanford. And he says, may I talk to him? 
And so mm -hmm. this is Virgil Roberts, and he called me, and um, uh, Virgil made a really good case as to why I ought to be going to Harvard Law School instead of Stanford. And the most compelling argument he made was, so Channing, if you go to Stanford, you will be one of how many black students? And I said, four. And he said, if you go to Harvard Law School, you'll be one of 50. What do you want your cohort to be? And I said, aha. <laughs> and he said, and furthermore, you'll get, out, you'll get back east and it'll be, you know. And I said, yeah, but it is Boston. It's really cold. And he said, yeah, you'll, get, you'll survive. And he was absolutely right. It was, it was, the, it, was um, it, it is in my top 10 of best advice that I've ever received. And he remains a good friend to, that, to this day. Um, and when I got to Harvard Law School, I hated the school, but the cohort that mm -hmm. I gained is, is, the, is the cohort that, that influences my life mm -hmm. the most. Mm -hmm. And it was a phenomenal, and to this day, it remains one of the most meaningful um, cohorts of uh, African Americans. Mm -hmm period. Mm -hmm. uh, because Harvard Law School has such large classes, approximately 580 to 600, mm -hmm. and, a, and about 10%, anywhere, it, it, 8 mm -hmm. to 10% of each class is African American, it turns out a lot of very accomplished mm -hmm. people. They don't all become lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, I mean, across mm -hmm. you know, all industries. Um, so, going to Harvard, what, what was that like? Because you said you didn't like it. I did. I'm a California boy, it's cold. <laughs> Boston was very, very racist at the time. They were going through a very ugly um, uh, desegregation of their schools. Mm -hmm. um, there was a woman named Louise Day Hicks who just had, who, who was, I mean, she's like Marjorie Taylor Greene is today. She was going around just lying and, and just ginning up all kinds of hatred toward black folks. I went to Boston thinking, oh, I'm going to this liberal haven. It's going to be like California. It's going to be wonderful, except there are going to be all these great Eastern intellectuals mm -hmm. and so forth. What I found was a city full of hate and division. Um, I, on the news, I'm watching in South Boston, I'm watching uh, white folks pull black folks out of cars and beating the crap out of them, and I'm shaking my head going, this isn't the city I thought it was. So, you know, I had to realize there are certain parts of the city not to go to, um, and then it was cold. Did I say it was cold? <laughs> <laughs> it was cold. I hated that. And then when I walked on campus, I, you know, all the, none of the teachers, uh, all the teachers were just old white men. Mm -hmm. And that was, I, I never bought into it. I think it's probably because of my family, mm -hmm. but I never bought into this concept that old white men somehow had the monopoly on <laughs> intelligence or monopoly on anything, anything, particularly the law, right? And so when I saw this, I so this is why I'm supposed to get my legal education from these guys. This is this kind of ridiculous, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, mm. you know, so it was it was not a good experience. I did not. I just did not like it. From uh, the it is Harvard Law School, um, and I did like Boston. Mm -hmm. So what did I like? It was that cohort of black students. black students. And also, you know, it was also a wonderful, um, when you were in Cambridge and you were in a, a student environment, there is no place in the country that has as many universities and colleges. So I like that and I love music. So mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. it was, I was able to continue to do at Harvard, that which I did at Stanford, which is I had a radio um, program at Stanford, at the Stanford radio station. I was able to continue to do that at Harvard at their radio station so I could play the music I wanted. 
And instead of promoting concerts like I did at, at um, Stanford, I promoted concerts. I didn't promote concerts. I managed bands at Harvard Law School. So I managed two bands. Nice. And um, so that got me out and about. Um, I probably should have spent more time studying. I realized that. There's that look in your eye like, Dude, when did you study? No, right? no, no, no. <laughs> but I probably should have spent more time studying um, because, you know, I wasn't a spectacular student. I was just a, I was a straight down the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, um. Did you, were, were the professors, uh, what, what, what was the um, interaction with black students in law school? I don't know. Don't. Did you feel any? I felt nothing. You didn't? Okay. No. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I felt, I felt nothing about the academic experience there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, look, I had, I had Archibald Cox mm -hmm. as my constitutional law mm -hmm. uh, professor. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember a, an I, I remember an exchange we had where uh, he asked me um, to explain how I got to a, a conclusion. And um, I, I told him that, it, it, for me, it was simple. I followed the dollars and the economics, and that's how I got to the conclusion. Because frankly, you know, if you can follow what, what the economic result is in this country, you can generally get to what the conclusion's going to be. And he blew up. I mean, he was just really angry at me. And, you know, he was, you know, a whole conversation about stare decisis and, you know, the, the whole the importance of precedent and the rationale behind. And I just looked at him and I said, I understand all of that, but that's what they say. It's not what they do. They de decide where they want to end up, and then they provide the rationale. And then he got really angry at me. And it was the only time, the only, pro only time I ever had a problem with the administration, which was they did say something to the administration. And you know, mm. my response was, look, I mean, mm. it's my opinion. I mean, opinions have to be, have to be respected, mm. period. And I'm not disrespecting him. Mm -hmm. um, and I know he thinks I'm not learning something, but uh, frankly, mm. I am learning something. Mm. <laughs> he just doesn't like right. what I'm learning. Yes. <laughs> right. There's good so, critical thinking yeah, going on. Yeah, you know, you know, it was, <laughs> and I, my parents raised me to just always be strong mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. about those kinds of things. And um, so mm -hmm. that was the only time I really got in any kind of trouble. But uh, I, I felt very little about the mm -hmm. academic situation. Uh, what I knew it was doing for me was training my mind how to think in a very organized way. Um, and, um, and it was training my mind to understand the, um, the structure mm -hmm. of, all of this from a, from a legal and, um, and financial perspective. Mm -hmm. So I tended toward financial courses. I took all the kind of business planning and mm -hmm. so forth courses as I could. I was not all that interested in civil procedure mm -hmm. or, or criminal law mm -hmm. or, because mm -hmm. I already had come to real conclusions about criminal law and what its purpose was and mm -hmm. how it gets implemented and so forth. And to me, it was already a rigged system. Um, so for, for me, my focus was to, was to figure out like how money flowed. Mm -hmm. And because <clears throat> that had its own form of, 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 of use for o oppression. Mm -hmm. And I felt mm -hmm. like for, for us as black people, it was, there was a mythology around it and mm -hmm. we couldn't get past the mythology, but I always found that once you got past the mythology, 
Mm. It wasn't all that difficult after you got mm -hmm. past the mythologies, mm -hmm. but you had to realize that you can do it. Yeah. You just had to bear down and, and focus on it. So after Harvard, what did you do? It's all over the map. Um, so uh, I did the very traditional thing. During the summers, I did the very traditional thing, which is work for a law firm. Mm -hmm. um, I got the benefit very early on of being um, uh, recruited by a law firm called Tuttle and Taylor and one of the key lawyers at Tuttle and Taylor was a litigator named William Norris and um, Bill um, was from Pasadena. I didn't know him and um, he uh, knew Charles Jones who um, had been uh, involved in getting the charges dropped against me in Pasadena mm -hmm. uh, and who ran the Western Center for Law and Poverty, mm -hmm. uh, black man, mm -hmm. Bill Norris, um, Midwestern, mm -hmm. white, very smart, mm -hmm. Stanford Law School, Stanford Law Review, clerk for the United States Supreme Court, um, and he had a law firm downtown. And he said to Charles, I want to recruit I want to recruit some black lawyers into my firm. And Charles said, well, look, if you're going to recruit at Harvard, here's a name you should go talk to. And um, I went to work during the summer right after my first year and the summer right after my second year for Tuttle and Taylor, um, which was a wonderful experience. Bill Norris, who, who no, who's no longer with us, um, was a mentor for me. Um, but the first interview, <laughs> the first interview, I have to admit, I thought I, I thought I was just dead in the water, um, because he hadn't. It wasn't until he was interviewing me that he put two and two together, and in the middle of the interview, he says, "Oh my God, I know who you are." And when somebody says that, that's never a good thing. <laughs> exactly. I, <laughs> and I'm thinking, there's no way he knows who I am because I've never met him. He's never met me. Yeah. And, he's, and I said, sir? And he said, I know who you are. And I said, okay, who am I? I, I got a little, like, mm -hmm. all right, who am I? Like, you don't know. And he said, you are the guy who had my children walking out of Blair High School in support of the boycott, and then he points at me, that you started. And I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured I'm done at that point, yeah. right? And he, we just had the best time. He loved it. Mm. He, I mean, he absolutely loved it. And he says, and he says, I remember, he said, and, my, and your mother taught there, mm -hmm. and, they, and she taught one of my children. And there was a mm -hmm. whole conversation and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, fast forward, to, uh, fast forward to Jimmy Carter being, becoming president. Um, my mother was on Jimmy Carter's transition team. Um, she had taught Hamilton Jordan at the Federal Executive Institute and had gone, during the campaign, had gone down to Atlanta to write policy papers for this then governor, right, running for president. My mother was on the transition team and I wrote to my mother and I said, whoever is handling um, the uh, appointments for Attorney General of the United States, submit Bill Norris's name. And so I, I put together, while I was a young lawyer at his law firm, a whole campaign for him to, become, mm -hmm. to be appointed. He didn't get appointed mm -hmm. then, but ultimately he was appointed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and was on the appeals court for, forever. Mm -hmm. you know. Where was the law firm? Downtown Los Angeles. That was that. Six and Grand. <coughs> mm, yeah. Okay. So yeah. then you came to L.A.? Oh, yes. And I then, came back home. And then you continued to work? Mm. So I practiced law for... for uh, a minute. I um, 
<clears throat> went to work. I took a leave of absence to uh, become chief deputy to a member of the city council. Um, actually, it didn't quite happen that way. Um, there's a member of the city council, Robert Farrell, who I knew. He was being challenged. They were trying to recall him. I worked a bit in the campaign to beat back his recall. I knew his then chief deputy. Um, and then he asked me, and she left, mm -hmm. she asked me if I could, if I would come on board and be like a co-chief with, um, um, with uh, another person. Um, and I said, I don't know, like politics, like mm -hmm. electoral politics, I don't know. And he said, well, just think about it. Um, and I said, well, who will it be? He said, well, John Murray, you and John Murray would run my office. And I met John, loved him. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, all right, let me think about it. And I got back to him and I said, look, um, because it was going to be a significant reduction in <laughs> pay, I said, here are my conditions. I get a car. I get to drive a city car. So that way it would offset mm -hmm. my gas and mm -hmm. wear and tear on my car, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I can look at your calendar and any meeting that you're in, no matter who it's with, I can sit in on that meeting if I want to. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you are uh, an acolyte of Tom Bradley, the mayor, mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to have a relationship. However you make that happen, I would like to have with some kind of relationship with the mayor. Right. <clears throat> In other words, I want him to know who I am. Right. Mm -hmm. And he laughed at the latter, and he said, well, that's kind of a hard thing to just, mm -hmm. I said, if you could just do your best in this regard. Um, and, uh, and I said, and I'll determine whether or not you're actually, if I feel like you're not living up to it, then you know, I'll, I'll just leave. And he laughed, and uh, he said, well, you would just leave me like that? I said, yeah, if you're not living up to your part of the bargain, because I'm going to live up to my part of the bargain. And uh, he, he said, you know what? You got a deal. And so I went into City Hall for two years and loved it. Great relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful relationship. It was a great, and it was a great time. Oh, I got him. <laughs> I, I, he lived up to his word. Tom mm -hmm. Bradley ended up being mm -hmm. someone that um, um, was important, important in my life, became even more important after I went off the staff because mm -hmm. um, uh, I didn't go right back to the practice of law. I actually, w w as a result of the relationship, um, Tom Bradley recommended that I sit on the board of a company in South Central LA called Economic Resources Corporation. Mm -hmm. I was the youngster on the board. The board was, um, did economic development in South Central LA. Mm -hmm. And the board was about half black, half white, and everybody on the board was highly accomplished. There were uh, senior vice presidents at two of the major banks, um, senior partners at uh, two law firms. There were judges. Mm -hmm. There were businessmen mm -hmm. on the board, and I was just <coughs> I was the young the youngster on the board. Um, and I was there really because uh, because of Tom Bradley. Um, was it an all-black board? No, no, half black, half white. Now these were <coughs> these were um, um, I, um, uh, Dick Border, who was the, the number two person then at, at I think Wells Fargo, was on the board. Uh, a senior vice president, of Security Pacific, was on the board. Um, Brad Clark, who was a senior partner at O'Melveny and Myers, was on the board. Um, a partner at um, Oh, Beverly Hills firm that I've drawn, drawn I've That's forgotten, right. was on the board. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. it was, um, it was basically almost right down the middle, half black and half and white. And what did this board do? Um, it was the policy board for a company called Economic Resources Corporation. And um, ERC was an economic development uh, company, nonprofit. Uh, in South Central LA. Technically it was in Linwood um, and it 
uh, had, at the time, the time I joined the board, it had built uh, a industrial park that sat uh, part of it in Linwood and part of it in Compton. And um, when I joined the board, that was basically it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it built an industrial park to um, incentivize businesses to come into South Central LA and to employ mm -hmm. people within the you know, five mile radius. Mm -hmm. And um, nonprofit, um, and um, it it was doing it did a great job. About two years, maybe not even a full two years after I joined the board, um, the president got an appointment in Washington D.C. President of ERC got an appointment in Washington D.C. Um, and I was on the search committee for his replacement. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the Congressional Black Caucus weekend um, and I visited with him. He had just started at his new job and uh, his name was Bob Kemp and um, mm -hmm. I, I went to Bob and I said, Bob, like, I'm on the search committee. We're out collecting names. Love to have you, you know, put in who you would like to see as your successor. Um, and he and I said, do you have any ideas? And he said, absolutely. And I said, all right, I'm here, <laughs> taking names. And he said, you. Mm. And I said, no, I said, no, I'm on the committee. <laughs> I'm here to take names. He says, no, no. He says, I'm not going to give you any other names. You should do this. And I said, I don't know. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense in my mm. career. He said, Channing, you should just do this. Mm. So uh, I said, let me think about it. And it was on a Thursday for the Congressional Black Caucus weekend, and he said, fine. He says, but go through the weekend, do the things, all the festivities behind that, and before you get on a flight back to L.A. on Sunday, I want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And I literally called him on the, on the, just before I left to go to the airport, and I said, I'm going back to L.A., and he said, so what's your decision? I said, if you still feel strongly about this, and you're willing to put my name in, I'm willing to be a candidate. And he said, Don. And that Monday he called um, and he said, y'all ought to consider Channing. And, um, and he's willing to be considered. And <clears throat> the board put me through the process just like they put through all the candidates. Um, and they selected me. And um, I had one board member who um, uh, was vehemently opposed. And um, I don't know how the votes went. Mm -hmm. I don't know how close it was or what, but I knew that he was vehemently opposed because he had made it clear that he was going to resign from the board if I became. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he felt like I was too young and too inexperienced. And frankly, the job was perfect for me. I, w I was young, I was 28, um, mm -hmm. but I was not inexperienced. Um, and I, I, I had lunch with this guy, and he was a judge, and he was black. And uh, I'm not going to say his name, um, but I really, I've not had a conversation with him since. I have no desire to have a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And what became clear to me was that um, he, it was, it was about self-hate. When I just got mm -hmm. to it, when I got down into it, I said, look, here's the, I, I, I went through with him all the reasons why I felt comfortable that I could do this job. And, and he just, mm -hmm. he would just like, I don't care. And I said, like, mm -hmm. what is it? And he said, you're going to screw it up like they all do. And at that point, I realized mm -hmm. that I was dealing with a very deep case of self-hate, mm -hmm. which I'd experienced before, mm -hmm. but his level of self-hate is like that of Clarence Thomas. It is mm -hmm. that, that deep mm -hmm. thing that they have done to us where even their own accomplishments, mm -hmm. they don't really believe, you know, and they don't, and they don't have 
they, they, he basically felt like it didn't matter what my accomplishments were, I was just going to screw it up. Right? Mm -hmm. And my attitude was fine, get off the board and, yeah. and, and move on. But it was a lesson for me. Mm -hmm. it, was, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a lesson um, at, at a good age, at 28 mm -hmm. years of age, um, to not make assumptions about where people are based upon their color, um, and to, uh, and particularly with respect to my people, to f really understand the job that they have done on us and our minds, and how it goes generation after generation and generation of self-hate and self-loathing, uh, our, our, our feelings of, of, of just not being worthy of. Um, and that damage is deep, and that it's and it's and it's across the socioeconomics of our community. Um, I just hate it at when we are in positions of power um, and positions of accomplishment to see people who still carry it. It's horrible. I get it for people who who just have had nothing. Um, because it's just it's tough to break out of that cycle when you when you have no resources available mm. to assist that. But when you've when you've been quote educated mm. and you've just failed to engage in 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 gaining your your psychological freedom, mm. it's a waste. Mm. It's just such a waste. So that was a real lesson for me. Mm. So I spent seven years there, uh, running Economic Resources Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, after five years, I uh, started to leave, and the board basically said, "Look, if you'll stay on for a little bit longer, um, you know, um, tell us what you want." And I said, "Look, I just need some more freedom to do other things. I'd like to spend time. I'd like to get back to the practice of law, and I'd like to do some entrepreneurial things." Mm -hmm. So I, I did. I yes. affiliated with a law firm, and um, and I did some entrepreneurial things. So and the and the board accommodated me, and so I stayed for seven years. I'm still back at your self, the the self hate. Oh, it's so deep. That's a. Is there? But it was purposeful. Yes, yes, but uh, among African Americans, I'm I'm sure that there is there a uh, is there much of a much attention given to how to remedy this? Do you? Not enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's interesting that you should say that. Mm -hmm. So the answer is. Um, it happens in, it happens from my experience here and there. So you, you, you see it at the family level. So on my father's side, four boys, one girl. Um, four kind of rambunctious boys, one girl. Unfortunately for her, she was the last. So <laughs> she had these four crazy boys who, who nicknamed her Pain. So it goes to show you, goes to show you just like how rough these boys were on her. Like Pain as short of for Pain in the Ass, right? <laughs> Um, that was my Aunt Minta. My Aunt Minta went on to get her PhD from University of California at Berkeley. Right? Very, very smart. Right? Um, but she did something for me, and, I, and it might have been, I don't, I don't know whether she just did this because she thought it was just appropriate or whether she did it to counteract what had happened in her life, but Every single interaction I had with her was affirmation. Hmm. Like, as even as a little kid, she would just, she would walk up to me and like go like this and like, how's my little genius today, right? I'm a genius, right? And my father would be like, don't tell that kid he's a genius, he's not a genius, right? <laughs> but it didn't matter because I could hear that, my father saying, hey, he's not a genius. Like, I'm dead, I know I'm not a genius, but I like her telling me that I'm a genius. Hmm. Like, 
You know, she was always very interested in what I was doing and everything was affirmation for her. And I've noticed that in, success, in successful families, um, families with successful people in them, and I don't mean just successful financially, I mean emotionally, et cetera. Um, a lot of affirmation mm -hmm. is present. Mm -hmm. So there's that level. And you see it here and there with families. In my family, we, we, affirm it, we intentionally try to engage in affirmation. We're big huggers. Mm -hmm. um, we're just, we're, we accentuate the positive. Mm -hmm. right? Um, I see it in terms of certain institutions, and it's very interesting. So, um, when I look at institutions like the Black Panthers, mm -hmm. and I look at institutions like the Nation of Islam, so the Black Panthers were decimated by the FBI and what they were doing was very American, very American. They started with, our people are hungry. You can't think on an empty belly. Let's feed our people. They're hungry, literally hungry. Let's feed our people, and they were in the streets feeding our people. As they were feeding them physically, they were feeding these young black kids' minds with very positive things. And yet, that was um, considered to be um, uh, considered to be uh, dangerous to this society. And they started being kind of terrorized by the police. Well, at that point, they did the next very American thing, which is, okay, if my life is at risk with guns, then I'm gonna arm myself. We have the Second Amendment here. I'm gonna arm myself. Yep. The first gun laws in the state of California came as a result of the Black Panthers arming themselves. That's what it was a reaction to. Black Panthers said, okay, fine. We're going to show you. You don't just come into our community and start terrorizing our community, putting our kids up against the wall, putting them on the concrete and putting guns to their head. We're going to show you that we can arm ourselves too, according to the Constitution, etc. Well, that shut it down really fast. And then ultimately the FBI just started engaging in a war against the, against the Black Panthers, killing them indiscriminately, etc. The Nation of Islam, I have my real problems with Elijah Muhammad and, and Wallace D. Muhammad, etc. The whole thing about, you know, white folks are devils and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's crazy, totally fringe, inappropriate, wrong-headed, etc. But, what the Nation of Islam was at its core about um, was very, very positive for my community. It was about people engaging in discipline, people engaging in self-help, people engaging in community and people engaging in freeing their minds from the shackles of hundreds of years of slavery. That's what was at the core of this. The, the, the <clears throat> natural <clears throat> progression that you would have seen in, 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 in the nation um, that, that, that you saw, um, you know, Malcolm X, um, moving toward and ultimately getting to, which with respect to Islam and the, the, the humanity of it, um, you know, the nation of Islam wasn't going to go there because it was, it, unfortunately the human element of, of power and greed mm -hmm. kept it there. 
But it was still about affirmation, and which is why it continues to exist today. I believe that this country probably would have taken out the nation, would have taken out the nation of Islam, um, had had the nation of Islam actually not taken out Malcolm X. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so, in some respects, in some respects, um, the um, um, the nation of Islam is tolerated to some degree, but the country hasn't quite. Folks who are willing to engage in violence haven't quite figured out how quite to deal with it because they protect themselves. So, you know, there are elements of it. I mean, if you look at where Louis Farrakhan is today uh, and his interaction with with um, uh, other leaders of faith, it's a very different Louis Farrakhan than he was mm -hmm. even uh, just a decade ago, right? Um, and so, when you ask me about it's here and there, yeah. and it's like most things, nothing's pure, right? Um, uh, I'm, I, um, I'm a member of, of, a, of a fraternity that um, has a mentorship program at the Watts um, Boys and Girls Club, and that mentorship program is very much about affirmation you know, self-worth, etc. These kids have never seen a judge. So we have judges that are a part of our fraternity and we go down there and the judges put on their judge's robes, have a conversation, and then they take off the judge's robe and they put the judge robe on the kid, put a gavel in his hand and talk to him. Now he's wearing the robe, right? He knows what it feels like to wear the robe. And just that act alone allows them to understand that that's a possibility for them. They could actually be a judge. And this judge has just enrolled them and is asking them questions and they're looking at this black man going, oh, well, wait a minute, he's actually a judge. So it's that in little ways we're about kind of freeing that mind, um, but not, a, a, not enough. Not enough. Well, we do it organization by organization by organization. HBCUs are mm -hmm. probably the most persistent environment mm -hmm. that we have today um, that, that frees the minds of young black people, mm -hmm. period. It, you know, my fiance went to, went to Spelman mm -hmm. for undergrad in Howard Med School. Mm -hmm. That means that she learned all of her college career were just nothing but young black women mm -hmm. and then went to an historically black men's school, right. Right, right, and learned around overwhelmingly black students. Now, Howard today is, is maybe only 60% in its men's school there. Um, but it, all the other 40 are mostly people of color. Uh, but that makes a difference, mm -hmm. makes a huge difference when you are in that kind of environment. I think HBCUs are very, very important. Um, it's, about, it's about the mental element. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're coming to the end and I wanted to just ask you, um, given the current climate in this country <clears throat> and the history of your life that you just described, um, what are your concerns right now, especially for the younger generation of African-Americans? Um, mental health is the thing that concerns me the most. Um, we're losing a lot of our talented young people to suicide. Um, I, have, I have good friends, several good friends, who have lost their children to suicide and these are all children of privilege, well-educated, um, who had already started making contributions to society. Um, um, and what we're seeing today, I think, has been, has been a real blow to, you know, to their psyches. Um, 
um, you know, as, as, we, as we make progress, progress is fulfilling, <laughs> hope increases, etc. But when you overlay, I mean, these kids are smart. They, mm -hmm. they, 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 they have the ability to pull back from, from the, the craziness of, 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 of the targeting and killing of young black men and women as an incident, they're able to, to recognize that and, and be appropriately enraged about it and to gauge in action about it. But just as importantly, they're also able to see the existential issues around our environment. And there's a level of hopelessness that's across the board. And for, for young, young black people, they see this battle going on against their own community. And at the same time, those same people who are in positions of control um, are, are standing in the way of us doing what little bit we have may be able to do to literally save the planet. And hope just starts to dwindle in many respects. Um, it, just, it, just, it just really does. Hope starts to dwindle uh, for them. And uh, that's a problem. That is a, that, that is a, a, a real problem. Um, and uh, many of them have not been through, um, you know, struggles, you know, on a, you know, on a, on a global basis. Like, you, know, you put the pandemic on top of it, that kind of global struggle is just becomes you know, too much. Um, so, you know, so when I say to them, look, if you look at where, where, we're, where we're headed, if you look at uh, where the United, United States is headed with respect to multiculturalism, you know, I view this uprising with respect to racial hatred um, uh, as being a bit of a last gasp. Um, this gasp would last for a, a while, right? But I think it's a bit of a last gasp, and I think the part of the reason why its its level of fervor is so high is is because there is an element of um, the inevitability of it. Um, but all of that creates turmoil in these kids' minds because they don't have the benefit of 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 a historical perspective. Period. Um, so I don't. I, 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 that worries me. I mean, that's that's kind of the way I look at it. Okay. But I'm also hopeful because I see them in the streets. Mm -hmm. You know. So yeah. we shall see. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, no. I'm I'm curious about. Um, um, oh, you mean share about my life? Yeah. Oh. Um, I don't know. I mean, look. T today, I, today I spend my world. Uh, my, my, I'm sorry. I just messed up the. the mic. Um, I, I, I spend. Uh, like I'm, a, I'm a senior partner in a major law firm, and um, for me, it's about uh, trying to influence the culture of our firm for it to be a mm -hmm. a, uh, a a culture and environment that allows our lawyers to give their best. Lawyers of all races, nationalities, you know, sexual orientation, etc., um, and that's not always an easy thing to do because big law is big law, and it and big law tends to be behind. Our clients are often out ahead of us, which is I find very strange because I got into the law because I observed lawyers being at the forefront. So I'm always telling the leadership of my firm that I think we need to be out ahead of these issues rather than constantly measuring the winds to see you know, where we can stand on solid footing. Sometimes we need to be on footing that's not so solid. 
Um, and I think we are particularly trained in, in that regard. So therefore, we ought to, ought to be there. Uh, my firm's 110 years old. Um, two years ago, I was uh, elected to the board of partners of the firm. There are nine of us. And so in 110 years, it took 110 years for them to elect a black man to the board of partners. Um, that's good, but also sad, right? Um, and, um, you know, and yet, when you look at the number of black partners here in the city of Los Angeles at major law firms, our numbers are higher than they've ever been, um, but they're not the pretty high, you know. They're, it's very, it's very, it's very slow.